Hello and welcome. You're listening to sermons from the audio archives of Christian counselor and speaker George Stanky. We hope you enjoy these sermons that are full of practical wisdom and solid truth to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Keep listening after the sermon for more information about George Stanky and the resources available to you from Renewal Ministries. So by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we trust you will be blessed as you listen to this selection from the archives of George Stanky. We've been talking about, you know, how do we pray for the lost? How, you know, how do we pray for someone who's religious but has never made a profession of faith? How do we pray for someone who has walked with God but is in a backslidden condition? You know, and, and we've looked at all kinds of scenarios, looked at all kinds of scriptures. And then we had uh, an evangelist come in and uh, talk to us ab- about sharing the good news in good ways and talked about the ABCs and then... Last week we wrapped it up on talking about the fear of God and how the the fear of the Lord is critical. This is how you pray for people, not just before they get saved, but specifically after they come to know Christ. Because where there is a lack of the fear of the Lord, there is an abundance of sin. And so understanding the fear of the Lord, letting that really grip us, um, actually growing in the fear of the Lord is really important for our walk in God. But it starts here. It's here. The battle is here. The battle isn't the tongue, though there's lots of scriptures that talk about that. The battle isn't where our feet take us. The battle isn't really in what we do. The battle really starts and stops right between our ears. I want to show that to you this morning. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 10. Finally, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We did a whole series just on the schemes of the enemy so that we would not be ignorant. Oh, I'm sorry. It's chapter (laughs) 6. I'm just... There's a 5 right next to it. It's chapter 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. For those of you that are trying to figure out what translation is he reading out of? (laughs) Sorry about that. My contacts must be in crooked this morning. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then he just goes off about taking on the full armor of God. The bottom line is this. We are in a warfare. We're in a warfare. The devil can't get your soul until he gets your mind. Do you understand that? The way to your soul is through your mind. He can't get your marriage until he gets your mind. He can't get your children until he gets their minds. He can't get anything. He cannot rob, steal, or destroy until he first of all gets into somebody's head. The battle is here. And so, thank you. I'll receive that. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1. What I want to do this morning is, is draw the contrast between the depraved mind the deceived and the corrupt mind and the mind that we are supposed to have and then we're going to conclude this and it probably won't happen today but we're going to go ahead and conclude with some really exciting scriptures about how that the battle is ours the victory is ours so I want you to hang with me if you get really discouraged today please don't miss next week because I'm going to we're going to go from the yucky stuff to the really good stuff but you've got to see the way it is You've got to see what it is that we're facing and what it is we're fighting. Romans 1, starting in verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And it's really important that you understand that. Because people are always throwing this up. You know, if God was such a good God, I mean, what about people that have never heard the message? They may have never heard the message, but they've seen the hand of the Creator. The Scripture says there is no excuse. There is none. Though we hear all kinds of them. Verse 21. For although they knew God, 
they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to us to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts, even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, He, ga he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Man, have we seen that? They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless heartless, ruthless, although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. What a list. What a description of the world that we live in. Man, oh man, I, every time I download my email, I must, I must get at least 10 emails a day of things that I don't want to know about. And, and even though I go ahead, you know, as soon as they come, I, I, I block them and delete them and they go in and, and create a file so that that email won't come, it comes down with one little deviation. They are determined to invent ways to invade our privacy. To, and, and what do they want to invade our privacy for? Why are they being so creative? Because they're after the mind. You see, if I don't think about it, I don't do it. And if I don't do it, they don't make any money. And it is about money. And it is about power. It's about addiction. It's about capturing the mind so I can get the body, so I can get the soul, so I can get the family, so that I can get the nation, so that I can get the world, so that I can really get back at God himself. See, you and I really aren't all that important to the devil. The only reason he chases us is because of who our daddy is. See, he wants to get back at Father God, and the best way to strike a blow at our Father is to strike his kids. He can't get to Father God. So he'll do whatever he can to capture his children, to bring hurt and pain and bondage into their lives. But it starts here. It starts here. Titus 1, verses 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted... And do not believe nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything that is good. What a wonderful description. Let's go on. Let's turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start reading in verse 17. Now, I will warn you, I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation because I, I just really like the way it brings out a couple of key words. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 17. With the Lord's authority, let me say this. Very important that you understand that Paul is not speaking on his own authority. Paul is speaking as a man ordained of God 
to speak into the life of the church for the church's good. He says, with the Lord's authority, let me say this, live no longer as the ungodly do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their closed minds are full of darkness. They are far away from the life of God because they have shut their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They don't care anymore about right and wrong. And they have given themselves over to immoral ways. Their lives are filled with all kinds of impurity and greed. They don't care. Paul is saying without apology, do not hang with these people. Don't be buds. And I know you're thinking of the same scripture that came into my mind. You know, we're supposed to evangelize but not socialize. But what about Jesus? He didn't just go to all the, the well people in the world. He went to the sick people. But guess what? He spent the majority of his time with a few chosen disciples trying to prepare them to take over when he had to depart. He spent most of his time pouring himself into 12 men, preparing them for ministry. On occasion, he ate with a publican. On occasion, you saw him with sinners. But most of the time, he was emptying himself into 12 men that would be charged with taking the gospel to the world. We are supposed to rub shoulders. We are, we're, we're, not, we're in the world, we're just not of it. And while we're in the world, we are going to meet people just like this. We're going to meet people who absolutely hate you. And the only reason they hate you is because you stand for something that is light, something that is life. And they're in the darkness. They like it in the darkness. They enjoy the darkness. And you are a threat to their lifestyle. And they don't want to hear what you've got to say. They are senseless. They have become fools. These are strong words, especially when the gospel says, do not ever call any man a fool. Those were Jesus' words. You call somebody a fool, and you're in danger of judgment. But the scripture does say that people who have just simply said, you know what, I don't need God, I don't want God, I embrace my sin. I enjoy my sin. These people are going to attack you. I mean, that's okay. Just understand that they will. And then the devil will use that attack to try to get into your mind so that you, to bring you to a place where you no longer evangelize. You no longer speak up. You don't share your opinion about the things that are right. For fear. And we'll talk about that as, as we go on. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing to do, have nothing to do with them. Let me read 2 Timothy 3, 5 in the New Living Translation. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. You must stay away from people like that. Now this may sound strange to you. You know, we've just spent five, six weeks talking about the importance of praying for the lost. And I, if I said it once, I said it a dozen times, if you're going to pray for the lost, if you're going to pray for your loved ones and your friends and your co-workers, then you've got to understand that it is God's purpose and deliberate intent to use you as His hand extended to reach the lost. Amen. It is a divine partnership. 
I cannot be praying for someone who's 500 miles away and not be prepared to confront someone who lives next door. But there's a balance. And I want, to, I want you to understand it. As you determine to share your faith, as you determine to keep Jesus first in your life, you are entering into a battle. You are entering into a warfare. And there are casualties in warfare. We do not have to be those casualties. We will be wounded. We'll be caring for a few people that may, that may get um, a little um, sideswiped emotionally, maybe even physically. But we should have no casualties of war in the camp of Christ. We shouldn't have Christians who are trying to live for God lose their faith in God because of this kind of spiritual warfare. It is not God's plan. It is not His intent. It happens. It's unfortunate. But it should never happen. We are to have nothing to do with them. 2 Timothy 3, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. If in the battle for your mind, in the battle for your mind, understand that who you keep company with, who you allow to, to have intimate, close fellowship with, says something about who you think God is. If you're going to keep God first in your life, then you need to keep good company. If you're keeping bad company, I will tell you without apology, you are not keeping God first in your life, and you will pay a heavy price. But pastor, you know, I, I can change them. You cannot. I can rescue them. No, you cannot. But I can make a difference in their lives. No, you can't. Well, I don't like the way that sounds, pastor. That is not what I've been taught. I'm telling you, the scripture is truth. The scripture doesn't lie. The scripture says that if you hang out with bad company, they're going to affect you. They're going to corrupt you. You are not going to touch their lives for good. They're going to corrupt you. And you're going to start bending your elbow. And you're going to start lighting up. And you're going to start letting your eyes wander. And I mean, how many times, and, and, I, and I, this is a, a, a grievous thing, but how many times have you heard of Christians swapping partners I have they'll go ahead and change partners on Friday and be in church on Sunday morning praise God hallelujah That's true. That's true. because they've been corrupted you don't hang out with people that hate God you just don't do it and if you're doing that this morning please for the sake of your mind stop now our lives do touch the unsaved I was one of these people before I was a Christian, I mean, they could have just put my name in these scriptures. George is this and this and this, and George is this, and, and, and it would have been very accurate. I didn't have time for God. And there were those that tried to evangelize me. And they were successful, and I owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. But I was never their best friend. They invited me to church. They invited me to Bible studies. They engaged me in conversation about the things of God. They confronted my sinful lifestyle. But they didn't say, come on over and watch a Bronco game with me. Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who are according to the spirit the things of the spirit for the mind set on the flesh is death but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so and those who are in the flesh cannot please God they can't please God. Now, I want to be a God pleaser. 
It seems to me there's a song or something about being a God pleaser. I want to be a God pleaser. I want to guard my mind. There's a scripture that talks about girding up the loins of your mind. I want to protect my mind. I have to, I have to confess to you, I, I, I have gotten lax on that. Those of you that know me, those of you that have been coming here for a while know, I'm just pretty open. There, there, are just, there is just no reason for falsehood, especially in the pulpit. Matt shared this morning a little bit of intimacy there, you know, just that uh, he'd been letting a, a few things slip. I, I appreciated your honesty, Matt. Some of the things that I'm telling you this morning, I tell you what, God is speaking to me and saying, George, you had better tighten up. You'd better tighten up. If my mind is on the things of the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That is as concrete as it gets. And if I am fulfilling the lust of my flesh, then I can tell you exactly where my mind is. And I can come up to you and, and, and I can say, well, you know, my heart was right. My, my motives were pure. And you could look at me and say, George, you're deceived. And you would be accurate. The scripture is very, very plain. The only reason that I sin is because I have allowed my mind to go someplace where it ought not to have gone. And because I didn't snap it back, something was conceived in my heart and carried out. Is that right? Is that what the scripture says? I want to be holy because he is holy. I want to be committed, not 10%, not 80%, not 95%. I want to be 100% for Jesus. I don't know about you, but that is very hard work. It's hard work. I am trying to work out my salvation. I'm trying to work it out in fear and trembling, understanding that, that God desires these things for me. But my desire sometimes wars against what God wants. So as you're praying for the unsaved, pray for your saved pastor. <laughs> that God would keep his mind where it needs to be. Colossians 1, verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Can anybody relate to that? You remember what it was like being alienated from the Lord? The psalmist said, if I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God won't even hear me. Well, if God won't hear you, what does that mean? Does that mean that the phone's just busy? Does it mean he's on vacation? He'll go ahead and get his messages when he comes back and catch up with you? If I have allowed my mind to be invaded, to be corrupted... If I've allowed whatever circumstance to take me mentally where I should never go and I sin and, that, and then I take the next step and now I cover that sin. Not with the blood of Jesus but with pride. You know, I, I want to protect. I don't want you to know that I've sinned. I don't want you to know what kind of trouble I'm in. So now I'm going to go ahead and sin again by covering it up. The Bible says... That person needs to understand that God isn't going to hear you when you pray. But I thought God always heard us when we pray. No, He does not. If you're having marital problems, if you are not in right relationship with your wife, your prayers are hindered. It doesn't say they're not heard, but they are definitely hindered. You see, our relationship with God isn't free. It cost Jesus. It cost God the Father dearly. And let me, let me share this with you. If we are going to be the kind of victorious Christians that God wants us to be, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us. We are not going to be able to just do anything we want because, bless God, all things are permissible. But the rest of that scripture says, but not all things are expedient. I am free to watch television. Whether it's wise to do that or not is debatable. That's 
one of the things that God is convicting me about. I just watch a little bit too much sci-fi, as my daughters can attest. Just something about science fiction that I really like, but you know, it takes me places where I just really don't need to go. So, I need to just repent and uh, change in that. Ephesians 4, 17, in the message, just, just the first half of Ephesians 4, 17. You can turn there because we're going to read a bunch more. And so I insist, and God backs me up on this. We'd already, we'd already read that, but I, ju- I just want to re- reemphasize that. You know, Paul is, talk- Paul is talking about um, speaking to us in the Lord's authority. And he, he is saying, I insist, you need to understand, I'm insisting with the full authority of God behind me. He's not saying, dear brothers and sisters, praise God, hallelujah, I'm so glad to be here today. and I'm looking forward to the potluck where we can just embrace one another, and warm fellowship, and fuzzy, ooey-gooey, wonderful grace. <sighs> He's saying, I've told you before, and I'm telling you again, people that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you hear me? Sometimes Paul is in your face. He's saying, I am telling you. I am telling you with all of the authority of heaven backing me up. Knock it off. Stop it. Or you will become a casualty of war. Romans 12 talks about the transforming. We just may get through this. It talks about the transforming of our mind. This is the good news. This is the great part. This is the hope. Our minds can be transformed. I have a computer. I, I don't know what it is about me and computers, but I am dangerous. I just load stuff onto my computer. When I study, I've got all kinds of things opened up, and I have crashed my computer so many times and had to just reformat the whole nine yards. There's probably a better way to do it, but I don't know what the better way is. So I just format the whole nine yards. I just wipe the hard disk clean and then take hours reloading everything back up. And I have lost track of how many times I've done that. And you know what? I think God has lost track of how many times he's had to reformat this computer. Because for whatever reason, it's just gotten corrupted. You know? Somebody deliberately with malice intent sent a message that had a bug in it specifically to corrupt these files and I didn't catch it and it just kind of got in there and just started working and just eating a little here and eating a little there and then the Lord tried to bring something up and what came up wasn't what he expected does that make sense? Romans 12 verses 1 through 2 this is in the version I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Please understand the strong language that he uses here. He is not playing patty cake. He's not, he is not concerned about whether people like him. You know, I thought we came to church to get built up and we've just been torn down. Thank you very much. I could have stayed home and had more fun. Paul is not concerned about whether he wins the apostle popularity contest. But he is very concerned that every single person that he ministers to he sees them in glory that he sees them fully equipped strengthened and making a difference I appeal to you brothers and I beg you in view of all of the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies presenting all of your members and faculties that includes what's up here if it doesn't start here, I got news for you. There ain't nothing else to present. If you don't start with this, you're presenting nothing. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and I beg you in view of the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all of your members and faculties as living sacrifices, holy, devoted, consecrated and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be 
conformed to this world, to this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewing of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the things which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. I am in the renewing process. I am not perfect. God's still working on my mind. He's still renewing. Every now and then, he's got to take that big bulk eraser and just got to just get some of the junk out of that thing. But he does it with the Scripture. Amen. As I dig into the Word of God, and, and it's a supernatural thing that I don't fully understand. There's something about just setting the Word before me that changes the way I think. It just changes my thinking. It changes my outlook. It puts new ideas into my mind that are right and holy, that counterbalance, counteract and cancel out some of the old ideas that I used to have. That's great. It's the renewing process. I want to yield my members. You know, sometimes we, we read that scripture, we want to yield our members. We don't want to be fornicators. We don't want to be adulterers. We, want, we don't want to be liars and thieves and murderers. You know, we don't want to go out... And, and do stuff with our bodies but understand your body isn't going to do nothing your mind doesn't tell it to do so if you're not submitting your thought life if you're not submitting the gray matter between your ears to the Lord the scripture says which is a reasonable sacrifice it is actually an, an act of worship before the Lord I love that I just want to be a worshiper of God. Then submit your thoughts to the Lord. Submit your mind. Put your mind on the altar of sacrifice and let God determine through His Word what goes in. Because then you don't have to worry about what comes out. Amen. 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 When's the last time you've had to apologize to somebody for what came out? Hasn't been real long for me. How about you, you know? <laughs> Ten minutes? <laughs> a week? I praise God that I have an advocate with the Father. I praise the Lord Jesus Christ that when I sin, not if. Scripture doesn't say if you sin. It says when you sin. I am so glad to know that, that in this renewing process, and I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get it right, that when I get it wrong, that I can go to God and say, Oh, Lord, wretched man that I am. <laughs> Here I am again. Will you please cleanse me? Will you please forgive me for what I've said or for what I've done? And I'm so excited about the Lord's response. He doesn't say, Pastor, how many times has this been now? I mean, how many times do you think we're going to have this little conversation? Aren't you, aren't you glad he doesn't approach us that way? Amen. It's like, man, I just get back under my rock. Thank you very much. The Bible says that he is just to forgive us, and not just to forgive us, but to restore us. You see, restoration comes partially by the renewing of our minds. Partially, it's, it's just an absolute grace thing. It's just God says, I'll forgive you, and you're forgiven. But then when we're forgiven, there's a responsibility. Because we, we don't want to be like those foolish Gentiles, like the unsaved, who continually tempt and test God. Paul wrote about them. He says, you know, we, just, we don't continue to sin so that we can just put God's mercy to the test, do we? He says, heaven forbid. I'm saved now. Praise God. I'm going to church. I, I accepted Jesus Christ last week. Let's go out and get drunk. I had a terrible day. You might not know that it's a sin to get drunk. You may never have read in the scriptures what it says and why it says that you shouldn't do that. But you know, I have to believe that in 
your conscience. Something that was written in your heart supernaturally that you haven't quite gotten to in the book yet, you know. Some of the scriptures we read about the ungodly, it says that they've, they've corrupted their minds and their consciences. God help us. God help us. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, uh, 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. There, there, there are deceitful desires in me. You might say, well, pastor, I thought you were saved. Surely there are no deceitful desires left in you. Boy, I do wish that were the case. I wish that were the case. I wished I could say I have achieved nirvana. <laughs> you know, I, have, I am the enlightened one. I am perfect. There is nothing evil in me at all. It's just all pure. It's all holy. I mean, I just radiate light. Let me show you. I'll just unbutton my shirt. and The light will just come. I can't say that. You were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The way that I wage war is I am in a put-off, put-on mode continually is I read the scriptures and, and the Lord convicts me and says, you know, I've been speaking to your conscience, but you've been turning a deaf ear. Well, here it is in black and white. Now tell me, what are you going to do with this? Then I humble myself before God. See, sometimes I don't, I don't always respond to my conscience. I know I should, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes it takes God speaking to me with a little bit more force before he finally gets my attention. I mean, this is true. My wife's lived with me for almost 28 years. She knows it's true. I have got to learn how to put things off and how to put things on in their place. It is not enough to just simply unload. It's not enough to just clean the house. You better make sure something goes back inside. You want to beat pornography? It is not enough for you to put a blocker on your computer. It is not enough. If you want to win, if you want to get por pornography out of your mind, it is not enough for you to just stop looking. It is not enough. You've got to put something on in its place. You want to stop drinking? You want to stop lying? You want, you, you want to get rid of the sin in your life? It is not enough just to put something off. You've got to put something on in its place. The scripture teaches that very profoundly. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You want to win the war in your mind? Don't get prideful. I have seen this happen so many times. You've got somebody in counseling. You, you're trying to, to work with them, with the scriptures, with the Holy Spirit, trying to break life dominating cycles in their life they have two good weeks and they just say praise God pastor I don't need to come in this week I'm free hallelujah and the next week I get a phone call from their wife and say my husband is in the ditch will you please come and help him get out we cut we cut God off at the pass we win a few little Victories, and we think that the whole battle's won. Be careful. Don't get all puffed up. Don't get all prideful. Don't think that you're above temptation, or that you can you can play with the fire and not get burned. You're gonna fall, brother. You're gonna fall, and great will be the fall. Acts 5, 4. Didn't it belong to you? This is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. 
Didn't it belong to you before you sold it? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've lied. You've not lied to men, but to God. Ananias died right there. And then his wife came in. She didn't realize what had happened. Anybody seen my husband? Oh, by, by the way, Mrs. Ananias, did you sell that piece of property for X number of dollars? Well, you know, we sure did. And we just gave it all to the church. Hallelujah. You see those men right there? They just carried your husband out and buried him. And now they're going to carry you. She died on the spot. The scripture says, Great fear seized the church. There's something about the lack of the fear of God that messes with our thinking. Ananias and Sapphira, were pri- they were just prideful. We're saved. We're serving God, man. We are right there by your side, Peter. We're here to build this great... We're here to build the kingdom. And the devil started messing with their mind. Somehow, they just thought they could lie to men. You need to understand, when you lie... You, you may think you're pulling the wool over a man's eyes, but you never pull the wool, the wool over God's eyes. I might be real gullible. Matter of fact, I probably am. I've been accused of that. You're just so naive, George. You just want to believe the best, and I do. I'm a pretty easy person to fool. But please understand, you never fool God. So you need to think. You need to think about what you're doing and understand that there is a battle And it begins with your mind. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, very familiar scriptures. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the Lord, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. It is a spiritual warfare. How do I win the battle from my mind? Man, I become a worshiper. I, I, make, I, I, I put the, the filter, you know, I've got a filter on my computer. How come I don't have a filter on the rest of my life? My, what my eyes take in, what my ears take in, it's data. It's data. It's going into my hard drive. Everything that goes in there Everything that goes in there stays in there to be resurrected at the appropriate moment. I don't know about you, but some of the things that have been raised up in me haven't been pleasant. Has your life been different than that? Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. That's the Christian filter. How much of what you do fits this? There is too much of what I do does not fit that scripture. I, I'm not proud about that. It's disgraceful for me to have to say that to you. I shouldn't have to. And it needs to change. I don't want you to get the wrong... Some of you probably wonder, I mean, is he watching the Playboy channel? What's he doing? No, I haven't gone that far. But I could if I don't change. It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little inconsistencies that throw the train off the track. It's not the great big tree that somebody fell. It's the little thing. There's some little things in my life that need to change. Aren't you glad that you're right there with me? Or else I'd be lonely. 2 Peter 3 1. Dear friends, this is how. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Colossians 3, 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because where our mind is, our feet go. If my mind is not on earth, on heavenly things, it will be on earthly things. And if it's on earthly things, my feet are going to go where my mind thinks, and there I am going to be, embarrassed again. 
I don't want to be embarrassed. Peter's saying, I've written several letters to you. You've got to read these things because they'll stimulate your thought life. Amen. That's a, that is a pretty good admonition. I think I should go ahead and open up First and Second Peter and start reading that today. I need my thoughts stimulated. I need my mind renewed. How about you? Are you winning or are you losing the battle for your mind? We'll close with this scripture and if the worship team would come up and then we'll just finish this next week. Romans 13, 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. And there are just so many scriptures. Oh man, we could just go on and on and on. But it is time to quit. Please understand, saints. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not mad at you. I'm not trying to beat you up. I just don't want to see any more casualties in this church. And there's no reason for there to be any casualties here. If we can allow the Holy Spirit, and, and it is, it's, it's all about the Lord. It's all about the Lord. It's not, it's not as, as we said in one of our men's groups, it's not, it's not white-knuckling it. I, that doesn't change anything. It really is taking our thoughts, taking our mind, and wholeheartedly, willingly, without reservation, taking it and laying it upon the altar and saying, God, this is my sacrifice. This is my act of worship to you. When you laid something on the altar in the Old Testament, the altar was kept burning 24-7. The flames, the altar was never to be extinguished. And there were even times when supernatural fire came down. One of the ways that I pray is I, I, I actually picture in my mind the Old Testament altar. And I picture Isaac being bound as a young man and being laid upon a makeshift altar. I say, Lord, I just, I, I want to put myself on the altar and I want your fire, I want your fire to burn out the things in my life that are not pleasing to you. I want you to send your fire and I want you to burn those things out of me that are distasteful to you, that are destructive to my family. Burn those things out of me that would hurt our church. Burn them out. And don't allow me to get off that altar until the burning process is complete. If you have to consume me, consume me. And I actually, I actually visualize it in my mind. I'm serious. I want to be all that God would have me to be, not so that I can be famous. Because there's somebody out there that needs Jesus Christ. And I may be the only Jesus they see. And if the Lord in His mercy chooses to place me before a sinner that needs to know Jesus, I want them to see what they need to see so that they can respond to Him. How about you? George Stanky is the founder and director of Renewal Ministries of Colorado Springs and has been serving in ministry for over 30 years, serving 14 of those years as a senior pastor. He's also traveled to Europe and Asia, ministering to missionaries and native pastors, as well as teaching and preaching the Word of God. George also provides counseling on a variety of individual and family-related topics, such as crisis intervention in marriages, parenting, church relations, internet pornography, trauma, grief, and more. For more information about George Stanky and Renewal Ministry, simply log on to renewalcs.org. That's renewalcs.org.